Hello and welcome back to Curiosity Mine. The Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge, New South Wales, Australia receives quite a number of donations on a regular basis from its contributors. I spoke with Jenny Brammel at the Australian Opal Centre about some of the most interesting recent donations that have been added to the museum's extensive collection. So this is a beautiful vellum knight. So it's the internal skeleton of an animal uh, that swam in the Aramanga Sea about 110 million years ago. Closest modern analogue really is the cuttlefish shell, the internal skeleton of the cuttlefish. This one is notable for its beautiful colour and pattern. We would never choose to polish a fossil, but this one has come to us in this way. And it's got the most gorgeous chaff pattern um, or broad pattern in a, a mix, a full spectrum of colours in, in light and crystal opal. So it's a gorgeous example of South Australian light opal as well as a fossil. If you'd like to learn more about bellum nights and see a really spectacular example of an opalised bellum night, make sure you check out this video in which you can also hear me mispronouncing the word bellum night way more times than I'm really comfortable with. Now we have a pterosaur tooth. Now this is literally rarer than hen's teeth. Um, pterosaurs are the flying reptiles that were here when the dinosaurs were on the land and the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs were in the sea. And they had these long pointed teeth. This one's missing the tip, but it's otherwise in spectacularly good condition. This is one of, I think, three pterosaur teeth preserved in opal in the collection of the Australian Opal Centre. We have a researcher who specialises in pterosaurs who will be coming to Lightning Ridge later this year and I can't wait to show her this piece. The donor of this piece brought it in quite some time ago and wasn't sure what they had and asked us and as soon as I saw it I thought I think I know what this is and I confirmed with, with Dr Elizabeth Smith and we were really amazed to see this and we were really concerned we'd never see it again. But two or three years later, the same person came back and had decided to donate it to the collection. So now it will be available for research, which is wonderful. This is a small part of a, a collection that came into us that I really love. These are um, four little groups that are all from one mine. So it's always great for us to have a variety of things from a single mine so that we can look at the range of plants and animals and other types of formation from a single location and compare that to other locations. In this case, we have three groups of plant material. So this is really typical material from Lightning Ridge where there's been a mould formed by a piece of plant material being buried in clay and then inside the opal that's formed in that mould are pieces of clay and possible what we call rot pockets. So where the wood started to rot away, there are voids that are filled with opal. I think these are just exquisite. There's a little group of purple pieces. Another thing that's interesting, just looking at this piece, and probably the others have got the same pattern too, a lot of the plant material here tends to have reasonably clean opal on one side, and then a lot of included material on the back. That piece has got that. Let's have a look. Same. So often the plant material has this, these blocky shaped inclusions of clay and clay right up to the surface on the back. We think what's happened is the plant material has fallen to the ground, been transported and buried, and as it's sitting bottom down, that bottom surface starts to decompose and the underlying sediment starts to sort of get absorbed up into the space. So we would hypothesize that that's the way that that piece landed. When it, was, when it was buried, and that it could have possibly sat on the ground in the air for some time with the bottom surface decomposing for a while before it was completely buried. So there's some lovely pieces with purple and blue. These cute little pieces have got sparks of green and orange. And again, a similar pattern. So less opal on the back, we'll call that the back, but less opal on one side than the other. And this little piece has got some pretty orange, green and gold and some green. So these have been sorted primarily by colour but also um, by shape and size. Now these are from the same claim but this is not plant material. These are what we call septarian structures. So there's been clay that has dried out 
and shrinkage cracks have formed inside the clay that have later filled up with opal. So it's sort of like a, a mud puddle or a clay pan, but in three dimensions. Um, and I think these are beautiful too. They're really interesting. So these are often confused by miners and by other people for things like coral or brains or any other structure that's sort of got a repeated septarian type structure. The septa are these divisions. If you think about the underneath of a mushroom, it's got all of those fine divisions. They're also called septa. So it's, it's from, from the Latin, I believe, for those divisions. A beautiful little sample of interesting pieces that are not worth lots in dollars, but are absolutely fascinating for the insights they give us into opal formation and fossilization. This is part of a collection that I really, really, really love that came in from a miner who had put aside interesting things over 10, 15, 20, 25 years of worth of mining uh, all around Lightning Ridge, all around the Opal Fields, Whitecliffs, Andamooka, Coobapiti, Winton, everywhere. Miners have these collections on their kitchen window sills and in their glove boxes of things that look different. And this guy has kept these things for years and then years later has taken the time during a holiday or COVID lockdown or something to sort of sort them into groups. So what we have here are a pile of chewing gum fossil. No, we've got a pile of really unusual little knobbies um, that look like we've discussed popcorn chicken, miniature cauliflowers, chewing gum. These again are the sorts of things that miners might easily confuse as a fossil, but they are in fact knobbies. So they're a nodular structure. Knobbies can take many shapes and forms. They're a geological rather than biological structure. And sometimes they come shaped like this. Um, so we call them chewing gum knobbies. And I think after today, we might call them cauliflower knobbies. This is a beautiful pile of Something that we see often, but not often in a group like this, this will be from multiple mines over many years. They're little knobbies that on one side have a hollow where there's been a secondary opal formation event and inside that would have been a kernel. So a little secondary nodule, if you like, or, or piece of opal. And those kernels have come out during the mining process to leave that little dish shape. We call it a meniscus. It's got that curve on it that we think reflects the fluid origin of the opal. And we think that perhaps there's been a hiatus in the opal formation that's left a void. And then later that void's filled with opal and there's been a sort of a break between the, the, the original and the secondary formation. So I think these are just divine. Sometimes these are mistaken as yabby buttons because they have this sort of vaguely round cross section. They've got a vaguely hemispherical shape in that direction and sometimes they have concentric rings, but they don't have the detailed structure of a yabby button. So these are all pieces where the other, the innie has come out during the mining process and we're left with the outie. And over here, we've actually got an innie. Its mate isn't here, but it could, for instance, have come out of a piece like that. So it's come from a larger void in one of these. And you can see, again, the outside of the kernel has that lustrous surface. It sort of almost looks like it's had a semi-polish on it. This is a pile of knobbies with a really different shape and form to our chewing gum knobbies. These are, are elongate knobbies. Sometimes we call these arrowhead knobbies. They've been given many names that just reflect the shape, but they've got this pointy shape. These are often confused as teeth or confused for teeth, fossil teeth, but they're in fact knobbies. And again, different shapes and sizes. That one's been broken through um, probably in an agitator during the mining process. And that shows us that inside that gray is a, is a dark gray near black core. We've got amber colored ones. Again, these are often mistaken for teeth and you can see why. So they're all sort of approximately tooth shaped objects, but the precise shape and the surface texture tells us that they're clearly not teeth, they're knobbies. The piece in front of this is really, really fabulous. I, I don't quite know how to explain this, but these are geological structures, septarian structures and it's got a fine septarian texture on this side and then broader on the other side. So again, really interesting lessons and clues to opal formation, I think, in these. 
And the last pile here are a bunch of um, elongate things. Some of them bifurcate or split into two. Uh, that's a really unusual little piece. And again, they're often pulled out by miners because they're so different. They're really distinctive in their shape and form. Some of these could be mistaken for teeth. That's quite possibly a little worm burrow or some sort of invertebrate burrow, but it could also be some sort of kernel infill or secondary growth. So another vaguely tooth shaped one. Fascinating little gadgets. I mean, how does that happen? The thing is opal starts as a fluid. It starts as water with a lot of silica dissolved in it. So it can take the shape of any void it goes into. Yeah, a really terrific collection of fascinating little non-fossils from a miner who's had a very sharp eye over many years. This is one of the prettiest crocodile teeth you'll ever see. So this is a 96 to 100 million year old little crocodile tooth from a crocodile that lived at Lightning Ridge a long time ago and could never have guessed that one of its teeth would be buried and transformed into the most gorgeous green crystal opal. I just think this is divine. It's the overall shape of this that um, gives us the clue that it's crocodile. It's got very, very fine surface striae if you look at it at a high magnification, but it doesn't have any of the features that would make it a dinosaur tooth or a plesiosaur tooth. Beautiful. This is the tailbone of a little dinosaur. I'm not sure exactly which kind of dinosaur, possibly an ornithopod, one of the herbivorous dinosaurs, but definitely from its tail. It's really beautiful. It's in grey potch. It's got some lovely black and it's got a little bit of the neural arch and the neural canal. So this section here, you can see the cavity where the spinal cord would have passed through. So part of the um, wiring that sent directions from the brain of this little dinosaur down to the tip of its tail. So it's not all there, the, the, most of the neural arch, the bit that would have sat on top has gone, but it's a very delicate, beautifully preserved piece from a dinosaur that was at Lightning Ridge around 100 million years ago. So this is a very special piece. This is a mammal vertebra, an opalized mammal vertebra. There's no play of color in this, it's potch, but mammal fossils from the age of dinosaurs are pretty rare in Australia. And Lightning Ridge is one of the only places that they've been found. And this is one of them. This actually came in from a miner who had mostly pieces of geological interest. Um, he knew he had a bone, but he didn't know that it was something quite so special. This, this is something that we will look to get some really interesting information from. One of the things that's obvious about it immediately is its size. So one of the stories that's often told about dinosaurs and mammals in the age of dinosaurs was that the mammals were tiny little things scurrying around under the feet of the dinosaurs and that they only became bigger and came into their own after the extinction of the dinosaurs. No doubt that's true to a point, but at Lightning Ridge what's interesting is that as well as small mammals, we have quite large mammals. And this is one of them. This is a, a vertebra or a backbone, in this case from the tail section of the back of a little dinosaur. But you can see that overall, the mammal vertebra is bigger than the dinosaur vertebra. So we certainly had as well as giant dinosaurs here, and we had them. We had lightning claw, which is an enormous megaraptorid carnivore. We had tiny dinosaurs here too, dinosaurs that were really small when they were adult. Um, and we also had some really decent sized mammals. So I'm looking forward to some research on this piece and the other mammal uh, vertebrae in our collection. Here we have a little coprolite. So a fossil poo. I don't know who pooed this poo, but it's a really neat little thing with a nice pinched end. And I shall call it Mr. Henke. Howdy ho! How do we know it's a poo? Because it, it looks like a poo, because of its overall shape. Sometimes poos are poos because you can see what's inside them. You can see what's been eaten. In this case, uh, that's unlikely. It looks like it's pretty well got no internal structure. So because it's translucent opal, I can actually use a light to look through it and I can see that there's no internal structure preserved. But it's the overall shape 
with the little pinched end. We well, can't be 100% sure it should be said too. That's, that's our best guess. It's a good chance of being a poop. <laughs> <laughs>
have been compared with dolphins. So dolphins of course are mammals, but ichthyosaurs are reptiles that were sort of dolphin shaped. So they were using the same sort of body plan as a dolphin. So if you imagine a dolphin shaped animal, that's a reptile, <laughs> um, you're getting somewhere towards an ichthyosaur. A beautiful set of vertebrae, again, to have a whole collection of them, not necessarily from a single animal. We don't have enough information about how they came out of the ground to make an assessment of whether they're from a single individual, but they could be. There's nothing to stop them from being. They've got some beautiful surface texture, something that I really love about this one. That broken surface shows us some lovely black opal on the inside. We'll often hear that Lightning Ridge is the only place in the world that you find black opal. Lightning Ridge is certainly the world's main commercial source of fine black opal, but there has been dark and black opal found in South Australia for a long time. And here we have a beautiful example of black common opal or poch inside an ichthyosaur vertebrae. Some of them have lovely colour. This one's been broken on many surfaces, so it's got a lot of chips out of it. It's an unfortunate thing that that's happened in the mining process, but the one thing it does do is give us a little window into the lavender and blue-green colour in that piece. So ichthyosaurs. Ichthyosaur fossils have been found at White Cliffs, at Andamooka, at Coobapedi. There's only one piece from Lightning Ridge that may or may not be ichthyosaur, whereas plesiosaurs, the other main group of swimming reptiles, we have lots of examples from Lightning Ridge. So there's something different about the lifestyle of those two types of marine reptiles. The plesiosaurs were swimming upriver to Lightning Ridge from what is now the South Australian Opal Fields and White Cliffs, and it appears that the ichthyosaurs were not. Were the plesiosaurs breeding up the rivers and the ichthyosaurs strictly marine breeders? We don't know, but it's an interesting question to ask into the future. Two really exquisite little mussel shells. Freshwater bivalves from Lightning Ridge. 96 to 100 million years old, and these are in superb condition. Really little damage, very light agitator wear from the mining process. There are at least a dozen and probably more species of bivalve mollusks found at Lightning Ridge, and that suggests to us that we had a really rich environment with lots of different niches that um, mollusks could make a living in. Um, some of them would have been down in the bottom of the river, some of them would have been on the weeds on the side, and so on. So there's some study underway on that at the moment, and we're really looking forward to hearing the outcomes of that. But these are superb. These have got really beautiful play of colour. We're very fortunate that they haven't been put to a lapidary wheel. Yeah, they're, they're amongst the jewels of the collection for sure. This is part of a beautiful collection of pine cones from a single miner amassed over many years. These beautiful little pine cones are from trees, probably Araucarian trees, so probably ancient relatives of things like the Wollamai pine and the Norfolk pine and the Bunya pine, so ancestors of things that we have today. They're really beautiful, they're very identifiable. Sometimes, because of the scaled pattern on them, miners will confuse them with scaled animals like reptiles. So occasionally we'll hear old mates found a lizard head or a fish head and it'll turn out to be a, an unusually large, long pine cone or piece of plant stem with that scaled pattern on it. But these are really beautiful. They're often compressed, so um, from one side to another. So they've probably fallen off the tree while they're still soft and green and just under their own weight started to just compress and, and sort of sag into the ground. And like a lot of the plant fossil, often beautifully preserved on one side and a little bit gungy on the other side, probably from where they've started to rot on the ground as they've fallen. Occasionally we find them with little stems still attached, which is cute. And occasionally we find them where they've fallen and actually landed sort of on their head or on their tail, possibly into soft sediment because otherwise they'd just tip over and then you see them compressing down this way, which is unusual. So again, telling us things about what they were actually doing and how they were moving when they were still um, part of a living plant or just recently part of a living plant. There's been very little research done on the plant fossil in the Australian Opal Centre collection. So if there's a paleobotanist out there who's interested in working on our pine cones and our plant fossil and all of the potential invertebrate feeding traces and other evidence of life uh, 100 million years ago at Lightning Ridge, get in touch.
is that here we have some big pieces of dinosaur bone and these have been identified as pieces of sauropod bone. And sauropods are the big long necks, as the kids call them. Sauropod bones are reasonably uncommon at Lightning Ridge, or rather they're probably not being identified very often. But these are terrific pieces. They're really big and they have terrific texture on them, both surface texture and internal texture. And there's something pretty special about sauropod bones. They have, it's a little bit hard to tell, but that's the outside surface of this bone and that's part of the inside and you can see they've got these air pockets. Sauropods in some cases were huge animals and in some cases they had air pockets, they had hollow bones to lighten the skeleton. So really, really interesting. Pterosaurs and birds, which are flying animals, have hollow bones and very fine bones to lighten them. Sauropods also can have light bones to lighten their skeletons because they were such massive animals. And they also partly breathed through their bones. So there's a breathing system in, in using internal spaces in the bones. But really beautiful texture on these, um, on the surface and then also internally. Many of the bones and fossils from Lightning Ridge don't have internal structure because the whole of the original organic material has rotted away and left a void that later fills with opal. But in some cases, hard pieces like bones and teeth and wood, um, if they're buried quickly enough, it can slow down the decomposition process. And through chemical transformations, the internal structure of the bone or of the piece of wood or of the tooth can be um, preserved in really intimate detail by the opal. There's not a lot of detail in this bone in terms of the, the structure of the bone as a whole, it's macrostructure. The ends of the bones aren't there, the articular surfaces where they join to other bones and where muscles attach to them. But nonetheless, we can tell that they're sauropod and we can have a really beautiful look at what the bone looked like on the inside. Here we have something completely different. The Australian Opal Centre collects opalised fossils and opals and opal related geological items but it also collects opal and opal feel related and inspired artworks, books, publications, um, archival materials and this is a recent donation of a work by a local artist named Graham Merritt. Um, Graham's moved away from Lightning Ridge now um, but he was very prolific painting and sculpting and this is a a uh, mining field scene with a very famous sign, Lightning Ridge population question mark. Typical of Graham's style. There's another one. We have a few of these. Um, they're lovely. And this one's training for the goat races. Goat races were a really beloved institution for many years at Easter at Lightning Ridge. Not on anymore, but um, again, Graham's captured the, the humour and atmosphere of the goat races. And with this collection came this lovely article from the Black Opal Advocate, one of the previous newspapers at Lightning Ridge about Graham and his sculptures. He made many metal sculptures um, of miners and mining machinery, uh, which are real treasures as well. We're delighted to have these in the collection and um, adding to other photographs and paintings and tapestries and all sorts of things that we look forward to being able to exhibit in our new centre. So those are some of the newest and most interesting pieces in the Australian Opal Centre's collection, including some opalised fossils, but also including some items that aren't opal or opalised fossils. At all, it's great to see items that help to tell the story of the culture surrounding the opal industry and the community as well. Thank you to all of the generous donors, which includes Vicky Bockross, Jared Giles, James Grigson, Michael Madsen, Graham Merritt and David Sanders. Every piece that's added to the collection adds a new aspect to the scientific and cultural information that we have available for research and education about the prehistory and the history of the Australian opal fields. It's incredible stuff and your generosity is greatly appreciated. The Australian Opal Centre thanks donors under the Australian Government's Cultural Gifts Program and the many others who have donated items to the AOC collection. Our sincere gratitude to all of you. This video was made with the help and support of the Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge. If you visit Lightning Ridge and you should visit Lightning Ridge, you should stop by the AOC's showroom in Morella Street and support this amazing museum. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. The links are in the description. And thank you for watching.